Good afternoon and welcome to the Naval Order, Continental Commandery. Uh, we're here today to, um, as part of our virtual lecture series. Uh, this has been some events that we've been doing now for the past six months or so and had uh, a lot of great uh, speakers with us and a lot of opportunity to talk about uh, Naval history, uh, Coast Guard history, the sea services, and have had a uh, really great response and uh, we're happy to have you with us. Um, today, we've got a special guest with us. Um, we have uh, Ms. Uh, Denise Krepp, who's coming to us from the Navy uh, Heritage and or Navy History and Heritage Command, and she'll talk a little bit about the new Navy Museum. Um, so, but uh, before we get started, uh, my name is Aaron Bresnahan, a uh, retired captain uh, here, the commander for the Continental Commandery. And um, one of the things that we're really uh, big on within the Naval Order is promoting the history of the sea services. Um, for those of you that may not know about um, the Naval Order, uh, the Naval Order was established on the 4th of July in 1890, and it was set up um, as a, an organization uh, that was really about sharing a common interest in naval and maritime history. Uh, like it was set up in Boston, Massachusetts. And the main uh, mission of the order is to pre preserve, promote, celebrate, and enjoy our nation's sea services and heritage. Um, one of the things that we try to do is commemorate um, our heroes and important historical events. Uh, we try to support the study of naval history through writing, speaking, and educational events. Um, we also try to preserve sea service historical uh, artifacts and documents and monuments. And, and we also try to promote camaraderie and uh, you know we have companions throughout the United States that come together for uh, events uh, whether it's listening to speakers or lunches or dinners um, and we also have annual meetings where we come together and we share um, but the one thing that makes us unique is we're the oldest American uh, hereditary uh, exclusively naval society and we're dedicated to really encouraging uh, the promotion and uh, preservation of uh, the history of the sea services and our, our linkage uh, with all our predecessors forges a common bond. And, uh, you know, we really want to focus on being responsible, honorable uh, service to this country. So, again, thank you so much uh, for joining us, for uh, being with us and, and hopefully, you know, learning today a, a bit more about, you know, what we're doing uh, in this nation and how you could be part of it. So thank you so much. So, again, uh, I mentioned that we do have a special guest with us. and. Uh, Ms. Krepp, uh, she's going to be talking again about where we see the future of the, the Navy Museum and, and also giving a little bit of insight into, uh, you know, the sort of the discussion that we've been having about how we name um, some of our bases and sort of the history that we have there. Uh, but I'll let her go into more detail on that. Um, just as a little bit of background, um, she began her career as an active duty Coast Guard officer. And after September 11th, uh, 2001, um, she uh, helped create the Transportation Security Administration and the Department of Homeland Security Committee. Um, during the Obama administration, Ms. Krepp served as the Maritime Administration Chief Counsel, and um, she also uh, was a special counsel to the Department of Transportation. Uh, and um, now Ms. Krepp is also an elected advisory commissioner in Washington, D.C. So she brings uh, a wealth of knowledge, a lot of experience. And right now she's on the director's action group uh, within the Navy History and Heritage Command. So without further ado, I um, am happy to welcome her with us and Hi. certainly uh, thank you for joining. Uh, well, thank you very much for having me. And, and so for folks that are uh, listening today, I have a PowerPoint presentation, but um, I'm never one to give a straight PowerPoint presentation because well, when I received them when I was a J.O., I kind of fell asleep. Um, <laughs> so here's my request of you. As I talk, please send in questions. Please you know, stop me and say, hey, wait a second. I'd like more information. H how does this apply to me? How can I be helpful? So um, please ask questions because if you don't, then I'm going to put my former professor hat on because I taught for many years and I'll be like, and what do you think? <laughs> so here's the deal. I won't ask that question if you ask me questions. Okay. All right. So why All right. and, and for those of you online, uh, you can ask your questions. There's a chat function. Uh, hopefully you can see that on either on the Facebook uh, live or on the, uh, the YouTube. So uh, feel free to add your questions as they come up and then we'll be able to share those with with her as, as they 
they arise. So please do. All right. Have we, we go to the first slide? Yeah. Okay. Guess we okay. need to back up one maybe <laughs> to the intro. Oh, that's fine. There, the intro. there we go. There we go. Okay. So, uh, all right. So we got the first slide. All right. So I work for the Naval History and Heritage Command, and the Naval History and Heritage Command is a command in Washington, D.C., at the Washington Navy Yard, and we are an amazing command. If, if you haven't had a chance, please come visit us. We have the archives. We have the library. We have art. We have underwater archaeology. We have the Navy's history, and, and, and it's important history because it's a 220-plus-year-old history, so it's just a phenomenal command to be part of. So if you look at the next slide, let's go there. There was an announcement made by the secretary, the former secretary of the Navy on the 13th of October saying, we are going to build a new museum of the United States Navy. Okay. And, and this has been a dream for about 60 years of former secretaries, former CNOs who said, you know what, this is really important. We, we really need to talk about the history. We really need to build a museum that talks about the Navy, because right now the facility is behind walls. Most folks can't get to it. Most folks, you know, if they don't have a cat card, can't see it. And that's unfortunate because, you know, we want to teach people, we want to tell the story of the Navy. So if you go to the next slide, okay. So this is where we say everybody else has a museum and they do. So by the way, I'm looking down and looking up at the same time. So the Air Force has an amazing facility in Dayton, Ohio. If you haven't been there, oh my gosh, go. I took my daughters there a couple of years ago. You can spend two days there and you learn everything from the birth of aviation and Wilbur Wright to the current, um, the planes. You can go onto the, uh, the presidential planes. You can do everything there for the Air Force. You go to the Marine Corps Museum, a similar experience that's down in Quantico. You go to the Army. Wow, that is an amazing facility at Fort Belfort. I had the opportunity to go see it. And to be honest with you, my favorite exhibit there was uh, Bratz to Boots. I'm an Army brat. My parents were both Army officers. So I was really excited to see how they brought in the fact that most of us who served come from families who served. So it was just a really neat exhibit. And it's new and it's open and people can see it. The Coast Guard, my service, is building a museum in New London. That's going to happen. That's going to take a couple of years, but they're doing it. And then we go and we look at what the Navy has. Again, the current museum, which is super, super cool, isn't open to everybody. Um, you know, I, I had the opportunity of chaperoning two trips to the museum, but in order to do that, we had to fill out security paperwork. And most parents were like, why do I have to fill out security paperwork to go to a Navy museum? Well, you have to do that because it's in a military facility. The building that we're looking at um, building is off the Navy Yard. It has the ability for people to come in and see it. And that's what's super exciting about this. Okay, does anybody have any questions so far? I'm seeing a screen that says more, more questions. Uh-oh, folks, if you don't ask questions, I'm gonna ask you questions. All right, let's go to the next slide. Okay. So here's the campus vision, and I'll kind of read it off and, and, and talk to you about it. Um, you know, it's going to deliver critical uh, information capabilities. It's going to teach history lessons. It's, it's we're learning from our past, and we're educating people. Um, you know, what I said, we have the archives. We have the archives. We have all of these papers and documents that go back to the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the Civil War, the War of... Um, uh, let's see, 1898, World War One, World War II, we have that and we want to share that information so that people can say, hey, you know, what happened 100 years ago? Are there any lessons learned that we can take from 100 years ago that we can apply to today? I don't know, but that's the type of thing we want to give scholars the ability to look at. And, and so that's one of the things we're, we're excited about. We're excited about educating through um, cutting edge technologies, live, digital, uh, virtual. Okay. For me, the best exhibit right now at the museum, at least according to the seven-year-olds that I've taken, are the guns that are taken off so they can actually climb on board and they're just, they're climbing and, you know, it is the most amazing thing for a seven-year-old. And by the way, they can't destroy them because, well, you can't destroy a gun. Um, but while the children are, 
are climbing all over things. Parents are reading things. And it's just, it's a super exciting um, possibility. But again, people can't see it because they can't get on base. So that's, you know, just critical for us to be able to share the message off the base. Um, the placement of the museum is critical. We're looking at putting the museum in the vicinity of the Washington Navy Yard. So why are we doing that? We're doing that because it, well, a couple of things. One, it's near two metros. So for folks who have been stationed in Washington, DC, you guys know where the Eastern Market Metro Station is, and you know where the uh, Federal Center Southwest Metro Station is. So you've got the green, the orange, and the blue lines. You've got people right there that uh, they'll be able to come in. You've got the neighborhood. The Washington Navy Yard has been here for 220 years. You know, it, it is a, you know, when, when you look at the museums I talked about in the Marines and the Air Force and the others, they've been in those communities, but they haven't been as long as the Navy has been here in, in, uh, in Washington, DC. I mean, if you look at the local community that we're in, Admiral Tenji, Tenji House, it's the CNO's house. He's buried about a mile and a half at, uh, away at Congressional Cemetery. Barney Circle, again, part of our neighborhood, named after Admiral Barney. The workers who built the Washington Navy Yard, the workers who were employed on the Washington Navy Yard have been part of this community. So that's why we're really excited to have everything here in Washington, DC. Then we're looking at, again, the, the historical context. Um, and and uh, again, applying lessons learned, uh, sharing information, just being a valuable resource to the CNO, to the SECNAV, to Congress, by the way, a mile and a half, to the neighbors, to veterans. Again, it's all going to be part of this campus vision. And, and that's why it's just super, super exciting. Now, um, if you go, let's see if I'm doing this right. If you go to the next slide we can talk about what we've done so far in 2020. You know, the secretary announced the new museum. That had to be the first part. We had to obtain funding. If you look at that, we've got funding for fiscal year 20, for 21, for 22. Then we've got to have a lead fundraiser because it's going to be fundraisers and a fundraising entity, a 501c3, that we're going to partner with to raise the money for this. And that's going to be very similar to what the army did and the Air Force did and the Marine Corps did. I mean, it it takes money and, and that's what's what's gonna happen is they'll be the fundraising arm. And then we're talking about an execution of the um, the engagement plan. And, and that's quite frankly, you know, one of the reasons I'm excited um, to not only give this presentation to you, but I'm really hoping you can ask me questions because I'd like to learn from you, what do you think should be in this museum? You know, what is of critical importance? I mean, I come from the JAG community. Yes, I realize Shakespeare said, kill all the lawyers, but a couple of us, it can be pretty cool. But, you know, I would like to learn from you. What what do the SWOs think? What do the SUPOs think? What do the aviators think? I mean, what do you want in your museum? Because let's face it, this is your museum. This, this is a Navy museum. So kind of hoping that we'll have some questions pop up here. Aaron, has anybody asked questions? Yeah, actually, we did have one person who had asked the question of, uh, you know, have you picked the location or where where will it be? You know, has the land been purchased or is it still something that has to be acquired? I guess they're they're wondering if it's going to be somewhere near the Nationals Park or right near the, the Naval Yard. Uh, I guess that, that's probably the intent of the question. <laughs> that is a really, really good question, because how do you build a museum if you don't have the land? We don't have the land right now. And, and the, the goal is to acquire the land in the vicinity of the Washington Navy Yard. So yes, it, it'll be next to us. We don't have the land. And, and that's what we're working um, with the city of Washington and with um, others to acquire the land. I mean, that's what has to happen. But but that that is part of, um, of what we're working on. So money, yes, land. Yes, um, making sure that our friends on the Hill like what we're doing. Yes, that, that is also part of it. it, it is making sure that um, we get what we need for this. Yes. Okay, and then, yeah, appreciate that. So I'm assuming that either the land would be purchased or maybe ceded from the city or, or somehow arranged for. Um, but I guess yeah. there's another question also being asked, um, what, what do you foresee being the staffing of the museum? 
Um, it, in other words, would it be manned or um, operated by personnel, or would it be um, maybe NAF or some some personnel from the Navy, his, uh, Navy history, history Heritage Command? So, yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. The folks who are going to staff it will come from NHHC, so we will grow, but we have a really amazing core group of men uh, and women led by uh, Dave Adams, who's a retired captain, and Chris Renfro, also a retired captain. They're beginning to grow um, and expand. Uh, and we're going to do something that's a little bit different. So the Army ended up putting people at Fort Belvoir. Uh, Quantico ended up, you know, kind of having to, to get, get additional folks we have a base here in Washington, D.C. We have the archivists already. We have the librarians. We have the base. And so we'll use that to, um, to staff and build and to, uh, to grow the museum. Other questions? Uh, I guess one other question is, um, why do you think it's taken so long for something like this to happen? Uh, I know maybe in the old days people would have had much easier access to the Navy Yard, but um, having uh, a museum inside of a, I guess, a military base is, is, you know, from a security standpoint, probably hard for anyone to, to try to deal with. So why, why hasn't there or why has it taken so long for this type of a museum to be developed? I think it's just, it's hard. I mean, the desire has always been there. If you saw on the first slide, you know, people have said for 60 years, but it's the ability to say, all right, we want the land, we have the ability to staff up, we have the ability to move out. And that's really what has coalesced over this past year. I mean, having the secretary sign the memo and make the announcement was critical. We had to have that first, and then we could go out with the fundraiser and do that. So um, I have to say, you know, extreme th uh, many thanks to former Secretary Braithwaite for really kicking this off and, and moving it. And, and we have a lot of support from the current CNO who has been very supportive of this. And, you know, it, it, the current leadership is just saying, just keep on going, just move out, please. More questions? Um, I guess another question is um, related to, uh, you mentioned all of the archives that you have and all the materials that you have. Is there already a concept of, um, I guess, how the displays will be looked? Or, you know, nowadays you have a lot of interactive exhibits and you have a lot of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, sort of being able to actually play with the material or interface yeah. with it. How how do you, how does um, I guess the leadership foresee uh, the future uh, museum and and uh, will there be children specific exhibits Will there be things for veterans or service members that, You know so maybe you could share. One of the things we're going to be working on is engagement with the various communities. So we'll talk to the aviation community. We'll talk to the SWOs. We'll talk to. Um, the sub, uh, submarine uh, guys and gals. So we're trying to find out um, first from them what they would like to see in, in their various exhibits. So we're kind of in the information gathering point and then with that going out. So yes, we have an idea of what we would like, but again, this is the Navy Museum. So we're seeking input from folks. So we have ideas, but what are things you know that are important to other people? I mean, and, and, and so it's kind of a, a push-pull situation right now. And it's very similar to what um, the Coast Guard is, has done as well, of, of going out and saying, all right, let's make sure that we cover all of, um, all of the components and, and making sure that nobody is left out. So that's why, again, we're in the collecting mode in the, um, the people and the assets and the battles. So that's what we're focusing on. Are there other questions? Okay, so Aaron, I, I have a question for you. In, in your role with the Naval Order, what would be the first thing you would say I need to have or you should put in this museum, Denise? Well, uh, going back to sort of the mission, uh, as I mentioned about preserving the heritage of the sea services, I think um, one of the things that we talk about with the Navy, as you mentioned, you have materials going all the way back to the Revolutionary War, and you have probably a, a huge archive of, of materials from you know the evolution of the Navy over time. <clears throat> so I think you know looking at the Naval Order, um, one of the things that we try to do is to 
also look for those little nuggets of things that maybe people don't know about. Um, things that are like, wow, I never realized that the Navy had something to do with, uh, you know, whether it has to do with the evolution of technology or it has to do with the evolution of, uh, you know, seamen or, you know, sailors or officers over time, you know, what, what kind of impacts individuals have made. So it's also about kind of finding those nuggets of history that are buried in a bottom drawer, you know, sitting somewhere where people, you know, can get access to it and know more about it. Okay. Um, would there be a particular part in history that you'd be interested in or, or just kind of general, let, let's find some good nuggets. Well, I think, um, you know, one of the things like I've, I've been to, uh, well, for instance, down in Pensacola, there's the, the flight, the Naval Flight yeah. Museum. So you have a lot of displays of aircraft. You have, you know, what it's like to be on an aircraft carrier. Um, I've also been to the Smithsonian and been able to see all the all the neat stuff about, you know, the evolution of the nation. So I think when I think about when I think about the, the Naval Museum and the types of things, as you say, it's it's so comprehensive to think about all the you know, 26 or so, so uh, different communities that we have. And, you know, whether right. it's the JAG community or the surface community or submarine community, um, I, I guess you could probably <laughs> almost go crazy with having too much information. So it's also about how you can focus on it in a way that that gives people, um, again, a realization of, uh, of, of how, as the Navy it has evolved uh, and the history that we've preserved, it, it's again, you know, highlighting those treasures that that really you know help people understand how unique and how powerful the navy is and what the impact it makes uh you know securing our nation and you know right. also making sure that we have freedom of the seas and power projection and you know some of those types of themes well and, and I, I think you, you hear admiral cox say absolutely um because when we look to the past we can see the future um, and we can use uh, the the past to help people understand um, what the Navy does. Um, you know, I, I was uh, I, I was really surprised when I you know I'll, I'll go back to the um, uh, field trip that I chaperoned to the museum a, a couple of years ago. Um, and I went to the class ahead of time, and you know, again, seventh and eighth graders, and I said, "All right, what do you think the Navy is?" and I got a lot of hands raised and like pirates, like, uh, not exactly, but we could go there as a, as a seven year old. But then, you know, I, I took him to the museum and I came back and said, all right, now, what do you think? What, what, did, what did you learn? And they just, they came back and it was just like words were tripping out of their mouths about, you know, baseball, because there's a really cool exhibit on baseball at the museum. They were talking about, um, you know, the, the, uh, the underwater part that the Navy has. They were talking about the sails. And that's, you know, what we're trying to do is, is really jazz people up and say, hey, th this is a really cool place. And, and that's part of the reason we're, we're thrilled to be able to share it here at the Washington, in the vicinity of the Washington Navy Yard, because that's what this neighborhood has been for 220 years. So we're, we're super excited about, about making it um, an experience where people can have hands on, um, but also one that, that's a learning environment a, as well. Um, what other recommendations would, would you have for us? Well, actually, there, there's a couple of other questions that have come up that might address that. Um, we did have one one question that came in um, that says, will the museum also house all the archive materials currently warehoused in the Navy Yard? Um, and what are the plans for archiving historically relevant uh, digital records? Oh, that is a really good question. <laughs> it's a really good question. Okay, so the majority of that, uh, at least for right now, is going to stay where we are. Digitizing. Wow, that that is a hot topic um, because NARA requires all of the information to be digitized, and, and that's making sure that we have the ability to do that. And, and that's something that um, had the uh, histories and uh, archives division is, is working on right now to make sure that not only do we digitize the information, but to make sure that people can have access to it. So that, that that's a big topic we're working on right now. Okay. Yeah. Another question came up. Um, the Naval picture slash uh, art gallery is being, I guess, 
I guess, perceived as being gutted at the Navy Yard? Will <laughs> the artwork and the pictures um, from decommissioned ships be housed at the, the new museum? Okay, yes. The building has been gutted, yes, but it's being rehabbed. It's being rehabbed right now, and it'll be reopened in the next couple of years. So, it, yes, we will make sure that all the artwork is protected, and yes, we will make sure that it goes back to where it is, and, and, and that should happen in the next couple of years. Will all the artwork be in the museum? No. Some of it, absolutely, but all of it, no. We'll continue to have it where we have it here at uh, NHHC. Okay. The, and then there was another question, uh, or at least it was a comment that mentioned um, a lot of times people have had their retirement ceremonies, uh, especially being on the Navy Yard and, and where you have the view of the river just outside the museum. And, and obviously there's kind of like a courtyard in, in an area where I guess people have had retirement ceremonies and, and been able to share with their families uh, sort of the Navy experience. How do you see that, you know, if we're now going to have the museum outside the Navy Yard and you're kind of more open to the public, uh, do you foresee the ability to to have those kind of experiences for service members? Absolutely. So so that's one of the um, the goals we have for the new museum is to be an event space. So um, similar to what similar to what the Army is doing uh, right now over with theirs, I mean, they're holding weddings, they're holding retirement ceremonies, they're holding change uh, change of command ceremonies. So yes, we do envision having the ability to um, use the, the new events, the new museum as an event space. Okay. In addition and to the, clearly having yep. the ability to, to do something similar with the uh, current facility that we have, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I've also visited the the Marine Corps Museum down in Quantico, uh, and as when you drive up there, it's quite impressive uh, to see the outside of the building, and then they do have spaces there as well for um, public events. So, it, I guess it really depends on the location and how much land you have, I suppose. Well, you know, it, it, one of the reasons we're putting, or we'd like to put the museum in the vicinity of the Washington Navy Yard, is the ability for people to take the metro. Um, to be able to, to to take the metro, the green, the orange, and the blue line to, to get there. Um, clearly, uh, people will be driving cars, and there will be hopefully a parking lot um, or parking facility that'll be there. And uh, still got to work about buses and figure out where the tour buses, because you know, it, right now when the children come here for their seventh and eighth grade visit to Washington D.C., it's it's very hard for them to come to the Navy Museum because again, behind the walls. But in the future, when it's off the base, then what we'd really like to do is uh, be a, a place for all the eighth graders to come to Washington, D.C. to learn about the city and to learn about our government. So we're really excited about this. OK, okay. next question. Yeah, next question. Uh, it actually had to do with um, I think this is really about how you can get more materials or how the public can be involved. But I guess the question is, um, is there going to be a program that encourages families to give, and this is in quotes, grandpa's old war letters to the museum? So I know um, the Navy Memorial, for instance, has the ability for you to kind of talk, tell your story and be captured as, you know, your history as a service member. But is there a way to get, um, I guess, additional material from the public about, you know, what they might have done during World War II or Vietnam War or, or even more recently in the Gulf War? Is there any kind of initiative like that? That one I don't know of, but I can go back and ask. I, I do know that there are two different initiatives that I would encourage folks to um, work with. So one, the Library of Congress has a veterans oral history program and um, they're collecting the oral histories. So I would definitely encourage folks to look at that program. Again, it's, it's the Library of Congress veterans oral history program. And then the uh, Women in Military Service for America uh, Foundation is also collecting oral histories from uh, women who have served. There have been about 3 million women in the United States who are serving and have served as veterans. So they're collecting. Uh, with regards to whether or not we will, I can't give you an answer but I, right now, but I'm happy to go and back and, and, and find one for you. Okay, next question. All right, yeah, the next question uh, is from one of our uh, companions uh, asking, how do you plan to be more inclusive of the en enlisted ranks? I mean, quite, I mean, you already mentioned a couple of admirals made comments and Secretary of the Ma Navy made comments and uh, the CNO made comments, but, but how do we really focus more on the role of, of enlisted personnel uh, in the development of the Navy or 
or how, how will there be a special focus on, well, on that contribution? Let's look at the makeup of the Navy. The majority of the individuals who serve in the Navy are enlisted. So they clearly have to be part of that. Um, you know, I, I'm lucky. My grandfather was a, uh, a Navy enlisted sailor during World War II. So um, I, I clearly have you know, respect for the enlisted community. And my grandfather, bless his soul, would come back and haunt me if I, you know, if I didn't make sure that the enlisted personnel were, uh, were part of this. So yes, the enlisted sailors will have a part of this uh, museum and clearly have to have a part in planning it. So yes, I, I can, without a doubt, yes. <laughs> They'll be part. No, right, and no, uh, and that's a critic critical follow up as well. Is really how I mean. Quite often, you know, maybe the Mick Pond uh, is, gives input, and and there might be some chiefs or senior senior enlisted leaders that are involved. And and I guess the question would be how how are you going to bring more people into the planning stage uh, to get those inputs? Well, that's, um, that, you're right. We need to do that, and, and that means that we affirmatively have to go out to the uh, Mick Pond to the uh, to the senior enlisted and say, what do you think we should have here? But again, if the majority of the sailors are enlisted, then we need to go to all the sailors and say, what do you think we should have in here? What, what is important to you? Um, or we could also ask, why did you join the Navy? And, and you know, can you share your story as, as a way to encourage others to come in? So yes, we do have a role, we do have a responsibility to make sure that enlisted and officers tell their stories and we get input from them. More questions? Um, there was another question that also, you mentioned before that there was going to be a, a charity or a 501c3 or yes. a, whatever designation um, okay. that would be working towards fundraising. Um, it, I guess for clarification, is the the is the intent that the Navy would have money appropriated for putting the museum together, or is it solely going to be built through donations? So the five hundred one c three, and and I'm reading this off now to make sure I get this one the name right. It's the uh, Navy Museum Development Foundation. It's being led by Vice Admiral uh, Kaneski. He will be helping raise the funds of some of the private dollars. Uh, that will help build the museum. So there are appropriated dollars that have been um, used and are continuing to be used for the campus program. And again, that office is being led by uh, Dave Adams and uh, Chris Renfro, both retired Navy captains. So it'll be, it'll be both. But again, looking towards uh, a lot of fundraising that's gonna have to occur over the next couple of years. Okay, um, another comment. Um, I, I, this was a, a second comment about uh, the retirement ceremonies, and you did mention, um, at least at the current Navy Museum, there's also places where people can have space and have receptions. Um, so I'm assuming that also the concept would be that in addition to having like a venue for an event, you would also have breakout spaces and, and places that the public can use. Um, Yes, yes. So um, one of the neat things we saw at the Army Museum, and we, we went and visited them last fall, was how they're using their space and how the, they're using, because while it is a big building, it's, it's still small, so they're figuring out how to put things on uh, wheels so you can move things out and in to um, customize the space. So that, that's what we're looking at doing. Of how, how do we maximize the space that we have for exhibits but also ensure that it can be a venue um, for retirement ceremonies. But then, you know, are there local entities that could come in? Possibly, but how do we give them the ability uh, to use the space? That, that, that's just what we're trying to figure out right now. Okay. Um, also, we have um, Captain Fred uh, Passman with us. He's part of our Continental Commandery, and he he actually had a few questions he also wanted to ask you. So I'm going to bring him into the stream. So uh, I'll add him here to the chat. Okay. So Fred, uh, hopefully you can hear us and uh, we can see you. So if you had any questions, very, very good. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Dee's. Excellent. Uh, so far, uh, as you're speaking, I have a, a page worth of questions. One, um, having recently visited the World War II Museum. Yep. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it's very immersive. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the footprint 
is substantial and clearly they raised quite a bit of that that section of the New Orleans neighborhood in which it's uh, been. Mm -hmm. And so uh, is it fair to assume, or can you tell me a little bit about the uh, community engagement effort that, that's that been embarked on in order to win the support of the folks who are likely to be displaced when we acquire the land? So that's not gonna happen. We're not displacing people. We'll be okay. going up empty. Uh, okay, so there's okay. open open space in yes. the property that, that's targeted. That's yes. excellent. Um, and can you speak a little bit to the lessons that you've learned from the recently stood up museums, like the World War II Museum, the the Marine Museum? Um, you know, because there's there's so much technology that's become available to museum curators in just the past decade, in terms of virtual reality opportunities. Uh, I was recently in a museum in Zurich where um, using uh, the, uh, you know, virtual reality yeah. headset, uh, you know, uh, goggles, was able to uh, be in a hot air balloon over the um, Peruvian desert, you know, hieroglyphs where you're, you're seeing these acres of, uh, uh, you know, these what, alien landing zones, we'll call them. Um, but... I'm thinking of giving visitors the opportunity to get the vir the virtual experience of standing on the deck of a, a tin can, of um, you know parachuting, doing a high low you know jump, um, things like that. Is that part of the thinking going on? Well, in order to make that happen, we have to lay the power lines. <laughs> So th that, that's one of the lessons learned of if you are ambitious, and that is ambitious, make sure that you have laid all the power lines and have enough electricity and make sure that Pepco, you call Pepco ahead of time and go, we may need a little bit more than we already have right now. So th that was some of the lessons learned of, of walk your way back and right. figure what you have to do to make sure y you can do that. So, yes. And, and so it's walking way back of, of, of what is what do you need in order to get to that technology, but also how much is it going to cost? And 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 how do we make that happen? So yes, we definitely had conversations um, with the Army because they're the newest and they, they've been very generous about sharing lessons learned. Excellent. Yeah. And then in terms of enlisted engagement, have you had any conversations with the uh, members of the uh, Association of the United States Navy? Uh, just upriver there over in uh, um, what's that small town where Annapolis is located? Oh yes, Annapolis. Uh, that was, <laughs> that was, yeah, uh, we we are just starting engagement. You guys are the first ones. Okay. My, the fan said, hey, you know, when I got the email from Aaron, would you like to do this? The fan's like, yes. You know, we need to get out. So yeah, we are just beginning all of the engagement right now. Excellent. Um, the other piece. Uh, to that engagement, in some cities, again, every naval order commandery has its own personality, its own gestalt, uh, even though we, we share some common visions. And at some cities, uh, naval order members play a fairly active role as docents of historical sites. And so right. I would plant that seed as an opportunity since uh, the uh, DC area has a very active Naval order commandery. That sounds great. I mean, it, um, uh, we need them because it, um, it's a good way to connect um, with people. I, there's a uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the museum. Um, is it the Mighty Eighth that's down right outside of Savannah, Georgia? It talks about the. Uh, uh, I think it is the Eighth, but anyway. I had the opportunity of going there with my kids about two years ago, and we met some of the docents. The docents had served as aviators during World War II. And, and to be able to be like, and this is what I did, and this is what my friends did. It's like, wow. I mean, it, it just kind of brings things to life. So absolutely, we, we have to have the ability to have people to connect with the story. And, and having docents who've lived there and been there, that's an important thing to do. Yes. Terrific. Um. So I think you already spoke to this a little bit, but kind of where is the team in terms of space conceptualization? 
Okay, you lost me on that one. Is it like okay? So when I think of a museum space, I can have you know the the, the the schematic we showed, and I think I can put it back up on the screen without losing you. Um, is let me go to the next slide. You probably uh, yeah, yeah that one. Okay, yeah. this slide. Uh, you know, so that that's a space conceptualization. I've got a large open space. I've got uh, various vintage aircraft uh, suspended from the ceiling. And so there are things like people moving from one space to another, maybe walking through an LCVM or, or, or a PT boat or, or a, a cutaway section of, of one of those types of craft as, as an example of conceptualizing the, uh, the space. So, all right. Where are we on, on those we're, sorts of concept development? We're working on that. We, we've been talking about that, and, and there are definitely documents. Um, and by the way, we, we talk about conceptual conceptualizing all parts of the Navy. So you're looking at a photo with which the aviators would probably like it. Sure. Right now. Um, <laughs> the submarine's like, ha, huh, hello, wait about us. Um, yes, we are conceptualizing it to include all communities in the Navy. We absolutely have to do that. And again, when we talk about communities, we often think in terms of the aviators, the submariners, the surface warriors, um, the special operators. And of course, within each of those communities, we have our subcommunities. So if, if you talk to, you know, Gator Navy versus uh, small boy surface warfare versus amphibs, I mean, versus, uh, let's say, large crafts, what I call yeah. floating islands. Uh, we're the same Navy, but we're very different navies, and the experiences are also dramatically yeah. different. How's yes. that playing into you know you only are going to have so many square feet um, in which to work. So has there been some conceptualization how so many different ways of being in the Navy are going to be represented as along with the historical component? We're working on it. and and part of okay. that, it, that's you know yeah. it, it, it's sure I mean in and saying, okay, in order to make sure we don't forget anybody or anything, we have to write everything down on paper and then go back and go, okay, we have so many examples, but we have this amount of room. How do we do this and how do we prioritize it? So that's the discussion that's being had right now as we go through. Yeah, but we have to write it down on paper first. Of course, of course. I just wanted, maybe you could expand a little bit on how that process is, is playing out who the stakeholders are participating in that process and and then what you see is the timeline for that process well that's going to probably take about a year or two um and, and making sure that we talk to everybody again you guys are the first ones which is why i'm asking you questions while you're asking me questions and i'm writing them down sure like, make sure i don't forget this um but yeah it, it, it's having this conversation to make sure we don't forget anything and that that's key to this it, capture it write it down and then at some point, we're probably going to have a room full of just paper and just just be checking everything off. Okay, yeah. great. Aaron, any new questions coming in from the yeah. uh, comments? Well, yeah, we definitely had a few people from the uh, National Capital Commandery who said they'd be more than happy to help out and to be docents and to, to get involved. So great. Thank definitely you. have some people there that are eager and anxious to, to participate. Um, Thanks for stepping up, guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We need, we need all the help that, that they can provide, that's for sure. Um, I guess one question that did come up is, uh, will this museum also be, uh, a, let's say, a research destination? So in other words, if someone is wanting to write a book about naval history or if, uh, you know, will there be that type of research um, access or some kind of a library or something that, that people would be able to uh, get more information? we're talking about that we're, we're trying to figure that out right now um because we clearly have all the books where we are right now and if we put all the books in the new museum that means it takes away from exhibit space so we're trying to figure out we're, we're just trying to figure out how to do this um and, and make sure that people can have the access to the books but we still have the room for the exhibit so figuring it out that's i know it's a squishy answer but figuring it out I hate to ask yes, no questions, but uh, that begs the question, uh, looking, let's say, 10 years in the future, is the plan to maintain the current facility as well as the new facility? 
Well, so the new facility will be a museum, but we still will have NHHC. So we're not giving up this land. That, that's for sure. Because you wouldn't want to lose that building. That's you know, classic. It, it, it is a, it's a phenomenal building. Yes. Yeah. And and thinking about that building, I mean, obviously there's the waterfront that's just outside of it. Um, has there been any plans, especially when you're thinking about the location, to have some access to the waterfront? Because I think one of the things yeah. that's nice about the current museum is you also have the museum ship right there at, at the at the pier. Oh, we don't anymore. The Barry left. Oh, did it? Okay. Yeah. I guess I haven't been there in a while. But yeah, yeah, the Barry left a couple of years ago. Yeah, so there isn't a ship here. Um, so that, that's the first one, but yes, um, we would like people to have access to the water. And, and that's part of the reason we're talking to the city to make sure that, you know, we learned from the city, how do they want to develop part of that land? Because it, it, it you know, it, it's clearly going to be a joint relationship of, of working to make sure that their interests are, um, achieved just like the Navy's interests are achieved. Yeah. Okay, and then another question. Um, obviously, the Marine Corps is part of the Department of the Navy. Is there any discussion about, you know, having the Marine barracks right near the Navy Yard? And is there any discussion about how you also include the story of the Marine Corps in uh, in the museum? Uh, that is the first time that question's come up. <laughs> and and uh, I, I know that the Marines have their own museum, um, but the Marine Corps and the Navy Yard have both been here um, for a long time, and they both responded when um, a certain other country decided to come and say hi in 1814. Uh, so, uh, good question. I'll get back to you on that one. Just good question. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I know when you talk to the Marines, they definitely want everybody to know that they are a separate service and that, you know, they, they have their own identity. But, you know, it's one of those things where we're still all part of the Department of the Navy. So I would hope we could at least include, you know, some reference to that relationship. Um, there is another question that came in, um, especially when we talk about, um, you know, the different communities. I mean, one thing that maybe people don't really hear a lot about is like, you know, the medical core or the nursing core or the, um, you know, any of those type of uh, supporting uh, organizations. You, you mentioned you were a JAG um, within the Coast Guard, but there's a lot of those communities that maybe people don't really know as much about. So how, how do you see that um, developing? Well, they have to be, they have to, they absolutely have to be part of this discussion and they have to be part of, of um, part of the story. Uh, you know, Navy medicine is, is celebrating its 150th anniversary this year. Many um, procedures and medicines that are used in the civilian world came out of Navy medicine. So yes, we should definitely be telling the story of Navy medicine, the story of the Navy nurses and the 12 anchors in, um, in World War II. Absolutely. They are a critical uh, part of this story. They, they have been part of the Navy, uh, the nursing corps for over 100 years, uh, the doctors and Navy medicine over 150 years. So, yes, um, let's also not forget about the chaplains. Uh, yeah, I mean, we need to cover every single component of the Navy, and that's what we're working to do. And another question came in um, about the relationship or if there is any relationship or any kind of overlap with the, the U.S. Navy Memorial. Obviously, there's a, a space already over near Capitol Hill where, you know, you've got the flags and you have the museum and things yeah, like that. Right. Is there any cooperation or coordination with the memorial? I, I know that um, the NHHC has a good relationship with them. Um, and I know that we'll be talking with them as we, as we roll this museum out, but I, I can't give you more specifics than that. Okay. Um, I, and then I guess, uh, again, with the Naval Order also promoting the, um, you know, the history of the sea services, uh, you asked me earlier some of the things that, that might be worth uh, also including uh, potentially. I mean, if we think back to the history of the U.S. Navy, it actually started out, as you know, during the Revolutionary War, where a lot of merchant vessels uh, were given, you know, they, they were privateers or they were given, you know, you know, authorization to yeah. 
to you know get underway and and defend the nation. Do you have any plans to talk about the the relationship of the merchant marine or you know even today where we have strategic sea lift or you know the relationship with the maritime administration when it comes to the logistics uh, of how we go to war and how we support um, you know the the sea our so, sea service yeah. in the Navy. we're clearly looking at every part of the Navy. And um, there is a very important tie between the surge fleet that is um, connected between uh, MSC and the Maritime Administration, my former agency. So absolutely, we, we need to go look at that story. We need to figure out how it's told uh, because the military logistics chain is critical. You, you know, if, if you go to our museum and you look at uh, the Korean War, the civilian uh, vessels that accompanied the, the, the military vessels were over 300. I mean, if, in order to be successful, you have to have the civilian fleet accompany the military fleet in peacetime and war. So how do we tell that story? How do we tell the story of the men and women, um, many of whom were and are on active duty, uh, Navy sailors, but also have served as civilian mariners? So yes, absolutely, we, we need to look at that story too. And, and knowing that the Maritime Administration also has their uh, headquarters just outside the Navy Yard, uh, I guess there's an opportunity there to, I guess, at least talk to each other and and, yeah. <laughs> and how you can tell that joint story. You know, it, and there's always been a really good relationship. I mean, uh, the former Marriott Administrator, was the, uh, Admiral Busby, was the former head of MSC and uh, worked closely with, with Transcom. So absolutely. I mean, the Navy is just, it's an amazing agency with some phenomenal allies. And and so just the ability to tell the Navy story and the ability to tell the Navy story working with others is just, it, it's going to be a lot of fun. And we're just really excited to do that and, and to work with folks to tell the story. So, yep, we'll get there and then we'll work with folks. All right. And then there was another question that um, was also asking uh, if there's any updates. Uh, I I know, is there any like newsletter partnerships with either like the Naval Academy Museum or the Naval Institute or or even, I mean, other, I guess, colleges or universities? Okay, so let's see. We've got um, 10 museums here within the Navy and the Naval Academy Museum is, is one of, um, is a Navy museum. So clearly we're going to be working with them. Um, We've got USNI, which is a, a, a private entity. So yes, definitely we'll be talking with them. Um, other universities, I could see that coming up in the context of maybe ROTC, but are you thinking in another way? I'm just trying to figure out the, the link between the, the non-military schools. Well, I think it's more about the fact that there are, as you say, a lot of organizations that try to tell the Navy story and there's different outlets for information. Um, but I think maybe the question is really related to, um, you know, again, how you get the word out, how we share information, how we take advantage of different, uh, you know, ways of sharing uh, and, and the different constituencies that we're serving. Well, I, I can tell you from this conversation, what I've learned is that there are a lot of questions we didn't anticipate, to be very honest. And I'm very, um, I'm grateful for everybody who's been writing, who's been asking these questions because we need to answer them. And I think as we go out and talk to more people, more people are gonna have questions. And the more people who ask those questions, the better this museum is going to be. So I wanna say thank you for asking these questions. And we got a lot of work, but but I think with everybody's partnership and, and willingness to help, we'll get there. And it, it's going to be a really good product. Okay. And I guess one question that we have as a naval order as well is, is there the ability maybe for you to provide some information that we could include in our newsletter? Because as I mentioned um, in a conversation you and I had previously, we have, you know, about a thousand uh, active uh, members and we have others that, that also get our information in different ways. Um, but would there be some material that maybe you could share yeah. with us that we could Absolutely. include in our newsletter? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and if you would like, you know, regular updates, if folks would, uh, we got to figure out how to provide regular updates. That, that is very clear from this conversation is, is how do we get the information out and how do we get out in a timely manner? Um, so if people, um, just stay excited and, and, and want to help. So yes, absolutely. I, 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 we'll figure that one out. Yeah, we'll make that happen. 
Okay, and and we also do have our a LinkedIn site, and we have Facebook sites, and we have other. You know, we also have our own uh, website where we post information too. So we'll we'll certainly, you know, raise awareness as much as we can as an organization. Um, um, I guess one other thing I did want to ask you about, and and this was something that you had mentioned. Um, you have, especially with the, the the national defense authorization bill that was recently uh, the veto that was overridden, that included also some discussion of renaming some uh, military facilities and bases. Um, you, I think you mentioned that you had a personal connection with some of the bases, and that you were quite instrumental in in advocating for for change. Could you share a little bit about that? Sure. Um, and, and now I'm going to be speaking as a private citizen and a uh, private citizen whose family was um, instrumental in starting the Civil War. Um, I had uh, family members, including a uh, my great great grandfather was Howell Cobb, and he was uh, pre- president of the Confederate Congress. His brother, uh, General um, T.R.R. Cobb wrote the Confederate Constitution, and um, as a private citizen, I worked with Speaker Pelosi to remove his portrait uh, from the U.S. Capitol because he, um, to be blunt, he committed treason. He went from being Speaker of the House of Representatives, uh, Governor of Georgia, Secretary of Treasury, to being the President of the Confederate Congress. So worked with them on that. I worked with the Coast Guard again as a private citizen to get the um, Confederate flag off Coast Guard land. And I, and I did that because not only was the Coast Guard uh, my service, but my great great grandfather was their service secretary. And um, I don't think that the Confederate flag should be flying again as a private citizen on the Confederate land. And then let's go for the Army. Um, my maiden name is Rucker. I am related to Edmund Rucker of Fort Rucker. I'm also related to Benning. And I, again, as a private citizen, um, was advocating for the past year for the renaming of army bases. Um, I can't be any more blunt. My family committed treason. They had to seek presidential pardons after the Civil War. And um, I, it's my personal belief that army bases should be named for individuals who didn't commit treason. So again, private citizen making those statements. I uh, appreciate you sharing that. I know it's a, it's an important issue, especially in our country today. You know, we really need to find ways to to create unity and bring people together, and and definitely appreciate you know the efforts that you made to, you know, to help us uh, heal, um, you know, and and you know overcome these issues. And and you know, I'm sure from a personal standpoint, it was um, you know a lot of effort went into that to 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 right, let's say, the wrongs of the past and to to really look towards a brighter future. So definitely appreciate your efforts there and your willingness to share um, as, a, as a private individual and, and, and for what you're trying to do to help the country. Um, I, I had a responsibility, uh, you know, um, I had a responsibility as the descendant of somebody who had to seek a presidential pardon for committing treason to right some wrongs. And, and that was, um, I, I started doing that after Charleston and um, and I just I've kept talking for f- for five years and, and and saying again as a private citizen, uh, they took up arms. My family took up arms against U.S. soldiers. They my great great grandfather on his way out the door from being speaker of, uh, not speaker as uh, secretary of treasury sent a letter to the to the folks of Georgia recommending that they secede. Um, it it's. Uh, what they did was wrong. And, and so my job as the descendant is to right the wrongs and, and to say we should have military bases, again, as a private citizen, that are named for individuals who are successful, who, who've, who, who've honored our country. And hopefully that'll happen. So. All right. Thanks for those comments and for, again, sharing with us. Um, I just looking at the chat here to see any other comments. Um, some people definitely thanking you for your viewpoints and about your ancestry and, and what you've been doing. Um, and again, people thanking you for, for sharing with us about the museum. Uh, it sounds like there's a, a whole lot of things that are going to be happening now over the, the coming years, a lot of fundraising, a lot of people uh, hopefully being involved in the planning process. 
uh, again, looking at the ways that our enlisted sailors have made a difference uh, for, for the Navy and for the country, looking at the ways the different communities can be represented and, and partner uh, with you as part of this process. Um, but definitely excited to, to hear that we're going to have a new Navy museum right down there near the Navy Yard that, that people can easily access. And especially in today's uh, security environment, you know, being able to be open to the public and for people to learn about this great Navy that we have is, is really exciting. Um, we thank you so much for, you know, being with us. Um, any final thoughts or anything else that we should think about as we start to wrap things up? Um, I, first of all, I want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to folks today. And, and then I haven't asked for you. Would it be okay if we, if I came back, oh, please give me time, um, <laughs> nine months maybe or a year? Okay, maybe nine months uh, to come back and give you an update and, and to share and, and just to kind of seek your thoughts on, on the museum. Could we just kind oh, of have a, kind of an ongoing relationship and, and how we work forward to doing this? Absolutely. I think uh, we, we definitely would love to see you come back. And um, I know Fred, he's excited to, uh, to, to continue to <laughs> follow up. Yeah. And uh, well, we're, you know, we definitely have a situation here where, you know, anything that we can do to share with updates or as Fred was asking earlier about the concepts or, you know, even some visualization to help, you know, whet the appetite of people to come, come by to visit. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, we also have our local, uh, the, the National Capital Commandery. Uh, there's a lot of individuals there. Um, our local commandery commander, uh, his name is uh, uh, Bill Stiegel. He's also quite happy to, you know, to be able to provide, you know, whatever efforts that they can, you know, either as docents in the future or if you just need, you know, volunteers and people to help out. Th that would be great. And, and I just really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk with them. Um, we're a couple of years out from being a docent, so you you, you know you, you don't have to be ready to do this tomorrow, <laughs> but absolutely be be ready to help and, and work with folks. So thank you very much, M much appreciated. And you know when COVID, when we have solved COVID, when everybody has a vaccine, I just encourage folks to come to the current Navy Yard, at, at the current facility on the Navy Yard, and and see it. I mean, this is your history. This is the Navy history. So please, if you get a chance come see the current museum when we all have vaccines, because I want you to see the current one. And then I just want you to be super excited about seeing the future one. So, so thank you very much. All right. Well, definitely, again, many thanks um, on behalf of myself, but also the Naval Order and the Continental Commandery. Uh, it was a really uh, great uh, discussion that we had. Uh, lots of good questions. Obviously, you can see that there's a lot of interest in this and yeah. we're certainly uh, on standby to help. And, um, you know, anything we can do to share information and to support you, uh, you know, we'll, we'll definitely get back to you. I, I've been cool. sharing your email address. So if anybody else uh, does have a question or maybe they uh, wanted to ask something, but didn't have a chance to, um, you know, we'll also be sure that they can get in touch with you. Um, but again, thanks so much for being with us. Um, we're going to continue having um, these monthly lecture series and we're, we're going to uh, have uh, a new slate of um, presenters as time goes on. So definitely those of you in the audience, uh, we ask you to come back and visit with us again and to hear more about um, what we're doing as a Naval Order and the different causes that we're supporting. Um, but as I said before, it's really about promoting and uh, you know making the most out of our, our the sea services and, and the history and the heritage. So definitely thank you for participating. Wish you all a good evening and look forward to seeing you next time. Again, my name's uh, Captain Aaron Bresnahan, and uh, thank you so much for joining. Have a great evening.